Good morning. To our friends and colleagues who are with us today in solidarity, including Israeli public officials led by Mayor Nir Barkat, I hope Deputy Minister Michael Oren, Deputy Director General of the Ministry, Michael Oren, Deputy D Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Jeremy Sakharov, representatives of the diplomatic corps, police officers from Israel and the United States, led by Major General Zohar Dvir and representatives of the police unity delegation. Our colleagues from the Consulate General in Jerusalem, led by Deputy, Acting Deputy Principal Officer David Burns, and to all our honored guests, thank you for coming today to offer your support and your respect on this 15th anniversary of the terrorist attacks against the United States of America on September 11th, 2001. I also want to add my thanks to Karen Kayemetli Israel and JNF USA for co-sponsoring today's ceremony and to maintaining this special, beautiful, evocative place of memorial and reflection. We come to it each year and it's a testament to the bond between the American people and the people of Israel and to our shared experience with tragedy. The United States has many friends, quite a few of them represented here by their diplomats and many of them have also experienced terror and loss. But perhaps none can identify more with our pain than Israelis. So Ron Lauder and Mike Nitzan, thank you. We're truly indebted to you to have this place in Israel to remember our losses. Among the nearly 3,000 souls taken from us on 9-11 were five Israeli citizens, Alona Avraham, Leon Libol, Daniel Lewin, Shai Levenhar, and Chagai Shefi. And there may be others present with a personal connection to other victims who fell on that day. So to all the families, we embrace you, we support you, we mourn with you, we stand with you in your loss and pain today and every day. And a special word of thanks to the young people who have come today. Your presence is vital. In fact, I want to focus my remarks today on you, on the next generation. Fifteen years. Fifteen years have passed since that dreaded day. Each anniversary carries its own power, its own meaning. All of them make us deeply aware of what and who we lost and of the responsibility that memory imposes on us. But this year, in a subtle but unmistakable way, our remembrances mark the transition of 9-11 from living memory into history. If we add the first three years of life before lasting memories are formed, a young person on the cusp of adulthood today whether graduating high school in the United States or enlisting in the IDF in Israel, has no personal memory of 9-11. Now to those of us who will always remember where we were on that day, whose lives and careers were permanently altered by those events, the idea that there walk among us people, adults, who can only relate to 9-11 as a historical event, although that's a natural process of time, is nevertheless a jarring thought. Those of us who were there, who heard the rumbles of the planes and watched the buildings fall, who trembled all day and all night, not just that day, but for days and weeks after, we will never ever forget. Those of us who prayed for our relatives, our friends, our co-workers and our fellow Americans, our brave firefighters and police officers who came to the rescue, we will never forget. Those of us who could smell the flames, who breathed in the smoke, those of us who had to sweep up the debris and the ashes, who watched those searing images replayed over and over, we will never forget. And for those who were sent into battle in the weeks 
and the months and the years after and for their families and communities, we will never forget. September 11th, 2001 is a signpost in our lives, one that can never be erased. There was a before and there was an after. So how do we ensure that the thousands upon thousands of stories of tragedy, of terror, but also of heroism and healing are passed on to those, unlike myself and so many of you, those who have no personal memory of that day? How do we teach the next generation? How do we make it real for them? It's a question we can't fully answer yet, a question we will need to ask ourselves over and over again on this and on future anniversaries. Yes, we can commemorate as we're doing today and as this memorial will do for generations to come. Yes, we can comfort providing what strength and support we can muster to families whose loss emanates from this day but radiates outward to affect every moment of their lives. Yes, we can document as the 9-11 Memorial in New York is doing through its collection of testimonials as we heard last year and we'll hear again today. Yes, we can rebuild as we have rebuilt both in New York and at the Pentagon. Yes, we can improve our defenses, which we have done methodically and diligently. Yes, we can counter the efforts of zealots and extremists who seek to carry out or inspire terrorism, as the United States has done together with our allies, many of whom have also been struck by terror through an unprecedented and uninterrupted global counterterrorism campaign. And yes, we can guard our values as President Obama said at Fort Meade last September 11th, which we do alongside, quote, our common belief that America is an indispensable force for good around the world and that our military is a linchpin in our ability to protect our values alongside our diplomatic efforts. All of these efforts are important and we will remain committed to them. But the next task relates to memory. Have we done enough to ensure that the next generation and future generations fully comprehend the calamity that befell us that day, the ways it changed us, and the responsibility it imposes on us? Israelis have repeatedly been faced with this question. They are a nation that has endured countless tragedies and more than one existential crisis, each of which shattered individual lives and stung an entire generation. Where Israelis have excelled and where we continue to learn from them is conveying the power of memory and history forward so that each successive generation understands the meaning and the obligations that flow from events which they cannot personally recall. Through national ceremonies, small graveside memorials, and a commitment to education, Israel plants seeds of understanding in those who were not there. And the result is a people that knows how to honor and grieve its losses, but also unites in common purpose to build, to serve, to protect, and to live out its most sacred values. Jewish tradition provides additional inspiration for our task. Each year, at the Pesach Seder, we are commanded to tell the story of God's liberation of the Jewish people from slavery to freedom. We are commanded, and you shall tell your child on that day. The goal is that in every generation, each person will see herself or himself as one who personally experienced the redemption. And so it is with us today. The obligation falls most heavily on the parent to teach and to tell, and I will teach and tell, but I believe it also falls on the child. So to each of you, I'm speaking to the young people here, 
Those who, you, who do not have your own personal memories of 9-11, I urge you, ask questions. Read accounts of the event. Learn the history. Visit the memorials in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania. Talk to families to hear about their loved ones. Honor the firefighters and police officers who gave everything to save others. And mindful of the obligation of the parent, I will also do my share of the telling. I want you to know about the fear that we experienced that day, not knowing from where the attacks came or what else might be in store. I want you to know about the vulnerability we felt, the shattering of our sense of innocence and sense of security, which to my regret, we've been unable to fully restore and to pro provide to you. I want you to know about the deep, heavy sadness, a sorrow that I've never known, that hung over our nation for weeks and months as the enormity of our losses and the pain of the family sunk in. But I also want you to know about some other more, in, more surprising things we felt, some drawn from my own story. On that day, I was at work on Capitol Hill, which we learned later was the likely target of the fourth plane, United Flight 93. Once the passengers and crew understood what was happening and what had already happened on the other doomed flights, they courageously fought back and against all odds managed to steer our nation away from further tragedy. Even as they perished and their families suffered irreparable losses, they saved others. I might have been among those they saved. So in addition to pain and loss and fear, I and so many Americans experienced incredible gratitude. Each year at this memorial, I try to spend a little time with the heroes of Flight 93, whose names are etched on this memorial, to thank them. Others have similar stories of inspiration about first responders, colleagues, ordinary citizens, and later the men and women of our military who served and gave and even died to keep others safe. The bravery and service and spirit that was exhibited through these events continues to inspire us to seize every moment to do and give and serve and build. Rosh Hashanah, the new year, is approaching. It is also known as Yom Hazikaron, or the Day of Remembrance. Let us use the power of memory, whether our own or those passed down to us, to inspire us to overcome tragedy and loss and build a brighter future and a safer world. Thank you, and Shana Tovah to all of you.